is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast, episode 191. Can't quite believe we're almost at 200 episodes. If you have got any ideas about how you think I should celebrate the 200th episode, then please do let me know. I um, have known it was coming for a little while and I've been avoiding thinking about it, but I've only got nine weeks left now, so uh, I should probably pull my finger out and figure out what I'm going to do to celebrate. In today's episode, then, I am talking to Denise Baden all about how to write eco-fiction, which was a really interesting subject for me because it wasn't something um, that I'd really heard about before. And so it was great to look at writing from a different perspective and a different angle. Uh, Last week's question was, what have you binged this year? Um, And we had uh, Lieber Blumenkrantz, I think that's how you say it, on Instagram said, Star Wars clone episodes, Rebel, uh, sorry, Star Wars clone wars, that's hard to say, and Rebels will be next. That show has a lot of mature themes that surprised me for a kid's show. So this week's question is, what topic is your craft catnip? So do you have like a go-to topic that when you want to study about craft or when you just want to read like craft books or you want to take a course, like what is the topic that you always find yourself going back to, even if you already know how to do it? Like that's, you know, it's almost like a comfort food, right? But it's like a comfort learning. Uh, yeah. Is there an aspect of craft that you lean towards? And and that could be like in business as well. I'm not, don't, don't think of craft as in purely writing. I mean, it could be, but yeah, maybe it's craft of the business or craft of marketing. Perhaps your go-to study topic is uh, is something in marketing. So yeah, let me know. The book recommendation this week is Ruby Rose. Yes, that is me. <laughs> uh, second book, A Game of Romance and Ruin. So this book is now with the editor on the final round of edits. Uh, well, I think it is anyway. Um, and so this week I wrote the blurb. So I'm going to read you the blurb. The digital Digital pre-order is out now. The um, physical hardback and paperback pre-orders will come probably towards the end of the month, early June. So there is a new launch date, which is June the 22nd. And of course, this is fantasy romance and, and this book is sapphic as well. And the blurb goes a little bit like this. In a game of power, can love be the deadliest weapon? Sterling Grey, legendary negotiator, is on a mission to mend her broken heart and avenge its ruin. Morrigan Lee, hidden princess and heir to the throne, is harboring a dark secret. For years, Sterling and Morrigan navigated the perilous games of power and politics, shared clandestine moments, and ultimately fell in love. Until a deal with fate forced them apart. When the Queen sets a formidable challenge, Sterling and Morrigan are thrust into a treacherous labyrinth of danger. The task? Protect the kingdom from a terrifying threat or lose the crown forever. But this is not a simple mission. With the clock ticking, they're going to have to trust each other. And that's not easy when their past is filled with betrayal. It's even harder when their hearts are entangled amidst the chaos. Now... Neither woman is sure if it's a throne they want to rescue or a love they want to rekindle. Two hearts, one kingdom, and a romance that could lead to their ruin. Or just maybe their redemption. This is a spicy lesbian fantasy romance with second chances, ruinous secrets, found family, a masquerade ball, a long con, and a love that could either shatter a kingdom or save it. So that is the blurb for A Game of Romance and Ruin. And I have to say, I am already having fun with the marketing for this. You all know I love a bit of spice in my fiction. And so uh, I last night I was going through the manuscript and picking out all of like the different places that they bang. And there's more in this book than there was in the first book. And yeah, I don't know, like I'm just very excited. I've already come up with like some f- funny TikToks about yeah I don't know I just (laughs) I just love this series and uh so anyway anyway not the point let me not dive into this this is not about uh (laughs) 
groupy this is about non-fiction and it's about eco-fiction so okay uh if you would like to pre-order you can do that it is going into ku there will be a paperback there will be a hardback um and uh but you can order the ebook right now Okay, so in personal news and update then, the book is with the copy editor right now. Um, I had to do some fixes last weekend that I think have really made the book quite a lot better. And I kind of like reached that point of, oh, oh, okay, like, yes, I've done the job. Like, I made the book as good as it could be. There's one tiny plot thread that um, I just want to tweak. Like, there's a reveal in the story that doesn't quite land how I, how I want it to. So I think, but what I've done is I've asked the editor to kind of comment on that and let me know, like, how they think that I can um, tweak it because, like, I want it to land with an absolute bang. And it's like, it's like a, it's like a firecracker, but not like a firework right now. So, yeah, I, like, I need to make sure that that lands perfectly because everything else now I am so freaking excited like I've got these intertwined like then and now scenes and yeah I don't know I just like I kind of don't want to talk about it too much until I get it back from the editor and I know exactly what's staying and what's going because we some of the then and now scenes um I may take out and I may use for like a bonus reader stuff like in my newsletter and, and bits and bobs for like yeah, maybe pre-order bonuses or, or yeah like stuff like that so I kind of don't want to say too much because I don't know what, like where it will end up but yes anyway so next week <laughs> prepare yourselves because I'm sure I'll be super giddy about everything that's going on but in personal news and update, well, like I've just said, last weekend, I spent the weekend uh, drafting. I think I did like 7K on Sunday, trying to uh, just add these final scenes. It's gone to the copy editor. I should get it back on Friday, Saturday time, at which point um, I think it's probably gonna have to go to a proof and then it's done and ready for ARC readers. Um, I am looking at all of the marketing in the background and I am also outlining book three. Uh, so once book three is done, my attention is coming back to nonfiction. So at the moment, I am prepping slide decks in the background, sort of in the evenings and stuff, uh, because I'm going to be recording some courses, yes, more than one. Um, and so those will be coming out in the second half of the year. Uh, but I'm already working on like the prep for that, which I'm, I'm really excited about. And uh, like half of the problem is that I've got too many different things that I want to write about for nonfiction. I've literally got like four different nonfiction ideas and I can't make my fucking mind up. So um, I, don't, I don't know. I will be writing a non-fiction in uh, October, November time. But uh, yeah, for now, I'm going to do some courses. Uh, what else can I tell you? Mm, I think that's probably it in terms of what I've been working on, because most of the stuff that I've been doing is like background marketing bits for, for the launch. So yeah, I think I will move swiftly onwards. The Rebel of the Week this week is Jackson. Jackson says, I have four siblings, an older brother, an older sister, and a younger brother. I was assigned female at birth, so for a long time my parents thought they had two boys and two girls. At some point, my parents discovered that my paternal grandmother only planned on leaving an inheritance for their first child, a boy. My parents raised the fact that it was unfair uh, that one child would get everything and that the three others would get nothing. So my grandmother decided to leave money for both boys. She said this was because the girls would have husbands to take care of them. Oh, <laughs> oh don't, can't say things that are in my head. <laughs> My parents rightfully thought this was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. They pointed out that she herself worked for most of her life and married later than many of her peers. She said, that was different. My parents didn't give up on arguing for equal treatment of their children, though. With time, Grandma relented, and each of us inherited an equal amount when she eventually passed away. It's sad, sad to think how much my grandmother internalised misogyny, but I'm grateful to my parents for sticking up for their children. I love that rebellion and I love that it was your parents as well that were um that that were supporting both you um and your siblings as well like it's crazy that we well me as a female can have internalized misogyny just because of society like it's nuts that we you know have all of these things that are that are pushed upon us and yeah it's just so important that we all do the do the work that we need to in order to learn and to grow and to you know move past these things 
If you would like to be a Rebel of the Week, then please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, uh, something big, something small, or something in between. You can email your Rebel story to Becca over on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com. No new patrons this week, but a huge, gigantic thank you to all of my existing patrons. If you would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes as well as bonus content, then you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. This episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, so I'm going to play a word from Kobo and then we'll get on with the episode. This episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Right now, digital books are reaching more people than ever, and libraries are becoming an integral part of that. In 2021, top digital library systems powered by Overdrive loaned 500 million books, an increase of 16% on 2020. That's half a billion book loans, which means a lot of happy library readers. You can easily reach library readers through Kobo Writing Life. All you need to do is go to the rights and distribution section of your book, click yes to overdrive and enter a library price. Your book will then be available to librarians to purchase for multi-loan use, but also for a one-time checkout option. Distributing with KWL means you're not paying any aggregator fee and you'll earn 50% on every library sale. If you're interested in taking part in library promotions, email KWL's dedicated author care team at writinglife at kobo.com and they'll add you to their mailing list. And don't forget to tell your readers that they can now pick up your book in libraries. If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and find them on social. Create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. I know what I should have asked. How do I pronounce your surname? Oh, it's Denise Baden. Baden. Okay. Baden, okay. That is yeah. how I was going to say it, but I just thought I would double check. <laughs> I hate getting it wrong. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Denise Baden. Denise is a professor of sustainable practice at the University of Southampton in England. She has published widely in the academic realm and also in fiction. Her eco-themed rom-com, Habitat Man, was published in 2021, followed by The Assassin and No More Fairy Tales, Stories to Save the Planet in 2022. Her most recent research explores the use of storytelling to promote green behaviours, looking at how readers respond to eco-themed stories. In 2018, Denise set up the Green Stories Writing Project that challenges writers to embed green solutions in their stories via a series of free writing competitions. These are open to all, and 17 competitions have been run so far, which have resulted in several publications. Denise is listed on the Forbes list of climate leaders, changing the film and TV industry, and speaks regularly on how to write for a cause. Hello and welcome. Hello, Sasha. Delighted to be here. No, it's it's lovely. Do you know, I don't think we've had an ac- academic on the show yet. So you, this is a first. So thank Yay. you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so would you like to tell everyone a little bit about you and your journey and sort of how you got to where you are today? Okay, yes. Um, well, I've had a very um, butterfly existence. So um, I went to the world of work and then all my friends came back from university saying how much fun they'd had. I mean, I didn't go just to be rebellious because it was expected of me. But um, so in the end, I thought, yes, I will go. And I did politics and and economics. And then I went off in the world of NGOs and not-for-profits and then industry and then publishing. I was selling books for a while. (laughs) And then I became a mum and it didn't kind of work very well with my big sales thing. So I went back to university. I did a PhD in psychology, um, sports Ooh. psychology, bizarrely. Oh, I was just about to ask because my background psychology. So I was very interested. Yeah. It always comes in handy. Always comes in handy. And then um, how did I end up? I ended up in the business school. I think I was doing something on entrepreneurial personality types. And um, I ended up in, in the business school and I nagged them about not having recycling. So when their business ethics lecturer left, they said, oh, you can teach that. 
And then I got inspired actually by a few works of fiction uh, to get interested in sustainability and green issues. So I kind of made that my platform. <clears throat> but I moved into the world of fiction because, like, you write articles on sustainability and, you know, you can have all the solutions, but we're talking to ourselves. And you look at how many people cite what I write and then cite it wrongly. And you just think, <laughs> I'm preaching to the converted the whole time. And and it's a difficult topic to be in because it's like sort of <clears throat> looking straight at the headlights. You, you know exactly what's coming. It's quite hard to go into denial or avoidance when it's my job. So I thought I need to move beyond the echo chamber. And I love reading. I mean, and I've, I have to write for a living anyway. So I thought I'd have a go at fiction. Oh, my God, it was so hard. <laughs> you think you can read a good book, but, like, I was listening to you talk about how to write a bestseller. Like, why is it a good book? You know, and you think, this book is like, suddenly I'm immersed in it. In this book, I can't see how they've done it differently, but I'm so bored. <laughs> so I had to learn all that. And I became an absolute addict of shows like yours and, and the Alliance of Independent Authors shows and creative podcasts and creative pen and, you know, all these different podcasts. I just, they, they were my journey, to be honest. So I'm walking the dog. I'm taking in the craft. And then when I'd written my book, I was taking in all the marketing. <laughs> so, no, it's been a great world. And, um, one of the things that's so lovely about it is when you meet with indie writers, they're just such a nice crowd. And if you meet with people who care about the environment, they're such a nice crowd. So you double down on that. And all I'm talking to are just lovely people, Aww. which makes it worthwhile. <laughs> yeah, what, what a lovely life. Like, that is so lovely just to be surrounded by, like, generous, uh, I guess, open-hearted people. That's that. Yeah. I love that. Okay, so we are going to talk about you know, writing for a cause. And so let's start with what is ecofiction and why is it important for indies to take note? Okay, so I get, even though I'm an academic, I hate categorizations, which makes me a very bad academic. Um, but there's so many varieties of it. So you've got your, your cli-fi, your climate fiction, which tends to be quite dystopian. It's very much terrible things will happen. <laughs> this is what it will look like. And I guess the hope is that people will read that and think, oh, I better do something then. Um, there's your solar punk, which is generally short stories set in the future, often focused on around renewable energy solutions. And ecofiction, I think it's probably more nature based. Um, so it's more about looking at the world through nature's eyes. So I guess my first book, Habitat Man, was a perfect example. Because you had amorous worms, you had, you know, magpies who would defecate on their enemies, you have friendly robins, you know, warring spiders, you know, and, and the, the key character sees the world through wildlife. And so you as an author are invited to see the world. And then when I was writing it, um, I saw the world very differently. And it's like when you learn a bit about art when you didn't before, suddenly you go into a gallery and you appreciate so much more. Mm. It's like when you learn about nature, suddenly you can look in your back garden and it like it comes alive under your eyes as you watch it. So I think that's something, um, if you can capture that experience of learning about something and it bringing it to life for you, and you can impart that to your readers, then I think it's just a lovely thing to do anyway, because nature is so beautiful. And I think more and more now, I think since lockdown, you know, we had that lovely spring <laughs> and we had all the traffic stopped and you heard the bird song. A lot of people, I think, woke up to actually nature as, as just a mental health resource and, and began to realize how everything's connected to that. Yeah, well, the, I saw some shocking things on um, social media, just, you know, things like um, the waters being clear in Venice and yes. things like all the smog disappearing out of cities and, yes. you know, stuff like that. That was just like shocking and phenomenal. Um, so, yeah, I love that. So, OK, I'm just going to literally throw you for a loop already because I'm already interested. <laughs> I'll take those different questions. Bring it um, on, Sasha. <laughs> what is different about writing for a cause than than writing not for a cause, say so to speak? Okay, so um when you write for a cause, you're passionate about it. You're intrinsically motivated. So you can't I think quite often 
especially with eco-fiction writers, there's a sense you really want to do something to help. And you feel if I can write it, it will happen. <laughs> And when I was compiling the anthology of stories, No More Fairy Tales, working with lots of different experienced writers, I definitely got that sense from them that they it's kind of like a form of therapy. <laughs> it's like I will write the solutions, people will, will read them and they'll make them happen. And actually there's some evidence that that is happening. Um, and I think for the readers as well, um, it's a whole new audience that I think Amazon haven't really got a, a category for it yet. But I think they need to 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 get one because it's a really growing niche. Uh, it's, it's less niche now. I think more and more people are interested in nature, interested in learning about the environment, and not necessarily in the context of doom and gloom, but in the context of just you know looking around you and appreciating what we have. Oh, I love that. So what, what, in your opinion, are kind of the key elements that make a piece of eco-fiction compelling and thought? thought-provoking as well. Okay, so I think part of that, and I, I forgot the second half of the answer I was going to give you, <laughs> one of the issues is writing for a cause is you can be too keen and mm. you forget that the most precious resource is your reader's attention. Mm. And you know, every time I've tried to do it, I've had to write everything I want to say just to get it out of my system and then ditch it. So Authors always have the tendency to info dump. And as you get more experienced, you learn to do that less. But I think it's a particular pitfall if you're writing to get across a point. Yeah. So if you're writing for a cause. So taking the info dumps out is absolutely essential. So I was quite keen on um, the idea of natural burials, for example. <laughs> oh, I've read about those. They're fascinating to me. They really are because I, I got a, um, you, I mean, I'm sort of toing and froing a lot here, but one of the reasons I started writing was when I set up the Green Stories writing competitions and I challenged writers to integrate solutions, they really were very bad at it because writing is conflict. They'd much <laughs> rather write about what goes wrong. But my research had clearly shown <laughs> that showing solutions is much more effective at inspiring behavior change than showing problems. And in fact, if you just focus on the problem, people might get all scared and might buy up all the toilet rolls and, you know, they won't necessarily think, oh, I'll stop eating beef and, you know, flying, or, you know, off to Indonesia or whatever. So it, if you integrate solutions and show role models behaving in sustainable ways, that's actually much more effective. But none of my writers were doing that. Or if they did show solutions, like I don't know how many... Um, stories we had on people going off to fight evil rainforest loggers and it's like your readers can't do that and they're not necessarily evil anyway it's a sort of systemic issue but you know putting mahogany coffins in the ground that affects rainforest destruction and you know we we all get engaged with funerals at some point so it's something everyone can relate to and um my um friend of mine her, her mother died and she talked to me about how they you know, did everything themselves and did it very naturally and sang songs. And it was just really inspiring. And I visited the Natural Burial Centre and I thought, right, I was going to have a, a, an info dump and I took it all out and I thought, well, Habitat Man is about someone digging in gardens. He can dig up a body. And then there's a nice opportunity for a natural burial. <laughs> and so many people wrote to me afterwards saying they changed their wills to have a natural burial because that made it sound so so wonderful. And that was just, that gladdened my heart. So, you know, show, don't tell is always an important rule, but I think it's even doubly down important for eco-fiction writers because the tendency is to want to, you know, lay down the statistics and raise awareness and be boring about a lot of stuff that you care about. <laughs> so let's dig a little bit deeper into that. Like, how do you find that balance between storytelling and conveying important environmental messages? Like, how, like what is the line between like any kind of tangible tips to know like oh okay I've gone too far or okay I haven't put enough or it's not clear enough or yeah like how do you find that balance okay so for me um beta readers are essential 
and you've got to not cry when they tell you what they think. <laughs> you've got to not be defensive and you've got to realise that actually readers are a little bit more intelligent than you give them credit for. Making them work to connect the dots is so much better than handing it to them on a plate. So let them make the connections between a behaviour and something you see later. You don't have to hammer it home. So I think trust your reader, I think. If you sow the seeds, they can make the connection. And um, I, I do quite a few talks on this and I sort of, I, I guess I use examples from what I know was my first book, Habitat Man, and I really had to learn how to do that for myself, where he's visiting gardens and every time there would be something else going on. So, you know, he falls in love with this woman who has a gorgeous dog. So, you know, the reader's watching the romance playing out, but he's looking at how the worm treatment and pet treatment is degrading the the, the soil and can sort of mention a little bit about that, which people don't know that, you know, when you put worm or flea treatment on your dogs and cats, it's not just affecting them. You know, it can take up millions of bees and other insects and um, especially if they, they go in the water afterwards. So it's worse for dogs that like to swim. You know, there's one where he visits the Wizard of Wollstone uh, and he's talking about thinking about how to make a habitat for bats and frogs. And the reader's thinking, why does the wizard want bats and frogs? <laughs> and maybe wondering about a bit of wizardry. And, you know, he goes rhapsodizing about um, home composting and the garden of the polyamorist. But the reader's thinking, when's she going to make her move on him? And what's he going to do? And so um, I, I kind of always have something else going on. Uh, in the garden, there's a feng shui garden <laughs> and, you know, there's a mysterious body hidden there. So what's going on with that? So you can talk about these things, but they always have to arise out of the plot and the character. And so, and it has to be subordinate to the plot and the character because, you know, if the reader wants to read nonfiction, that's what they'd read. So it's just being really strict with yourself, I think. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that applies to any niche where there's like, even like historical, like if they yeah. wanted to read nonfiction, they would. They're not. They're coming for the fiction. So like, I think I think that's very wise advice. Let's so I think it's different when you are a professor with a whole career's worth of information and knowledge about a particular <laughs> subject. But let's say you are a new writer um, or new, newer writer, new even just to eco fiction. Yes. How would they approach it? Like, where would they do their research? How would they do the research? Like, you know, give the, give listeners some tips and advice on, like, how to research and do, portray accurate eco-fiction. Or I think accurate, that, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a really good question, Sasha, because I think if you're taking it upon yourself to tell other people what to do or think, you do have to um, do your your research um, and it's easy to get it wrong. So, for example, I had a writer, we had a children's competition and they had this gorilla gardener who was actually a, a, a gorilla <laughs> and he was pulling up weeds to sort of plant pretty bedding plants. And she was calling that a green story. Now, it's not because any ecologist will say, well, butterflies love nettles and, you know, wildlife loves bramble. <laughs> you know, and these bedding plants are actually really bad for, for, for wildlife. So... I once did something and I put a bit about sustainable palm oil in there. And then I did the research and it turns out there's no such thing really. It's just as bad. <laughs> the only solution is to use less. So you do have to do your research. But one thing I think you can be sure of is people who care about the environment really want other people to care. And to go back to what I said earlier, they are so nice. Now, I mean, an example is Dave Goulson, um, you may have heard of him. He's a professor of biology at Sussex University. He set up the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. He's written lovely books. Um, my favourite was The Garden Jungle, How to Save the Planet Through Gardening. And he's a lovely writer and he cares so much. When I told him I was writing Habitat Man as a kind of fun way to engage people in wildlife gardening, he could not have been more helpful. He read it from cover to cover. And he suggested bits where I got something a little bit wrong. You know, he, he added bits. He said, I'd love you to include this. Can we make this work? I mean, he really wanted to get the word out. And he loved the idea of using fiction to do it. So don't be afraid to ask people, because if they're in that world, they will want to help. 
And uh, my initial inspiration actually was a real life guy who gave up his job in London to um, to become a wildlife gardener, to help people make their back gardens wildlife friendly. And, and he said to me, I can only do a few gardens and it's so frustrating. And that's when I had the idea for the book. I thought, well, I, I can probably increase your reach. And again, he could not have been more helpful in giving me all the information I wanted. But again, as you, you'll know this, I'm sure, but sometimes the more research you have, the more you want to not waste it and it can increase the, the tendency to info dump. So again, you, you do have to make sure what's in there is correct, but, but less is more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. So how do you incorporate, like you sort of mentioned about dystopian in particular, sometimes being quite sort of dark and like the, the pessimistic side of things. So how do you incorporate elements of hope and resilience into an eco-fiction story to help inspire people to take action rather than to feel like, you know, things are have a terrible outlook? Yeah. Okay. So um, there's a number of ways you can do it. So you can set the story in the future and you can showcase what a sustainable society might look like if we did it well. So we've got a few stories in the anthology, No More Fairy Tales, that, that, that do that. And they're never about that. You know, they're about something else. Um, but that's the backdrop to it. And you think, oh, actually, I'd quite like to live there. <laughs> and so it can kind of seed ideas. Or you can aim your stories at sort of mainstream readers, set it now, and just plug in solutions, which is probably a bit more what Habitat Man does. So I've got a character I think you'd love – Sasha, she's very rebellious. Um, it's my main character's lesbian flatmate. And um, she's a real joker. And she set up this random recipe generator where you have, it'll randomly pick low carbon seasonal foods, always with one joker ingredient, like nettles or insects. And you have to use those. So it's kind of like a very difficult version of Master Chef. And um, so it's a really fun way to integrate low carbon eating into the plot through this like ridiculous random recipe generator who's kind of um, catchphrases, this tastes absolutely disgusting. <laughs> so, oh, <I> <laughs> so, so humor's, uh, 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 you know, quite, quite a fun way in there. Oh, I love that. That almost gave me like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy vibes. Like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay. Um, let's say a writer wants to have a go. Mm -hmm. Where do they start? What advice would you give them to, like, how would they approach the genre? What What are their first steps in, you know, sort of approaching, understanding and making a, making a step into this genre? Okay. Um, so I think a good thing is to perhaps read some eco-fiction. So um, I set up an imprint to support the Green Stories project called Habitat Press. So we've got some examples there of, you know, got of um, various genres and short stories and novels and so on. Um, others not on their Overlord by Richard Powers was quite a good one where he looks at the world through trees. The, the stories are all centered on different trees and the human stories are kind of adjacent to them. Um, one of them is, is What on Earth by Susan Cope, which is a young adult one, which imagines two kids get transported into alternative futures. And um, I love that because I, I was a bit of a consultant for her and I saw one of my ideas pop up in there, which was delightful. <laughs> um, so have a little sort of mess around with the genre and get a sense of it, but it's new. So one of the things I found really hard with Habitat Man, there were no eco-themed rom-coms with a hint of cosy mystery. I mean, there were none. So I have no comps. It's main marketing. <laughs> Incredibly difficult. So you're carving out in a way a new field. Um, but I think a nice place to start is the Green Stories writing competitions. We have regular competitions, um, short stories, novels. So we've got a novel prize coming up um, in June. And we ask for three draft chapters and a synopsis. And if we like it, we'll ask for a few more. Um, so they're quite good for setting deadlines. <laughs> And there's quite a lot of resources on the website. And I also do regular talks. Quite often they're open to the public. So um, I'm always very happy to help. 
Okay, and I and I'd love to explore that, and because I was going to ask about kind of the talk side of it, because mm. obviously you expect as a non-fiction author, you expect mm. to do talks and present and things, but um, I suppose my question is what. Oh, I think I've got three questions. So my first question is, what have you learned about writing for a cause by doing this? Because I think there are probably skills or lessons that are applicable to any cause writing. You know, let's say you want to yeah. write on women's health or you want to write about men's mental health or you want to write about, um, you know, child poverty or, you know, there are so many causes in this world. Like, what have you learned about writing for a cause that you feel is like a real um it's really helped to kind of push you in in your like business okay so some causes you're only going to be writing to those who already know about them and are interested in them but with the environmental cause I think most of us are wanting to move outside our echo chambers and reach a broader audience so I do think it works quite well just to take a classic genre and maybe smuggle in some of those nature themes or eco themes or climate solutions in there within a classic genre, because then you can reach a much wider audience. Whereas if you're just trying to aim for the eco fiction audience, it is quite a niche audience. And you're kind of, in a way, preaching to the converted. So um, I would say don't be afraid just to take whatever genre you're already in and think, how can I integrate, you know, some some aspects of that so i mean for example one of our green stories winners his story uh was set in the future where a guy wakes up and he's been cryogenically frozen (laughs) and he's like oh my word how did i get here and his children are now older than him his wife's in the care home and society looks very different so that's a lovely opportunity to, to show what a different society could look like. But at the same time, it's a bit of a thriller and there's a mystery and it's very exciting on its own terms. So, you know, it doesn't have to be obviously about what it's about, if you know what I mean. I think you can smuggle green bits and eco bits and nature in, into any kind of story. And so what about like the business side in terms of like doing talks or taking out elements of the from the fiction in order to help promote it? Like, what have you learned about kind of the business of being a cause writer? Yeah, so um, I found, like, for example, um, we got, with the No More Story, uh, No More Fairy Tales Stories to Save Our Planet, that anthology was shared at COP27, so the Climate Change Summit. And um, I wrote one of the stories for that, The Assassin, which is about eight people, one of which is an assassin, (laughs) in a citizens' assembly debating climate solutions. And we're turning that into a play, Murder in the Citizens' Jury, which they want to put on at COP28. So um, I'm just looking for a theatre group to help workshop it. So, but, you know, there will be people, so many people now are interested in climate or interested in nature. So you can do stuff on sustainable fashion and there's lots of people interested in that. You can do stuff more on wildlife and there's all kinds of groups who will help you promote you there. So um, you can tap in depending on where you've sort of placed it. Um, There's a whole solar punk scene which promotes each other's stuff. There's the Climate Fiction Writers League. So they've got a newsletter and they you know, share stuff and promote stuff as well. So you can link with with other authors. Yeah, so you can sort of link with other eco-fiction authors, do joint promotions and so on. And you do tend to find a sense that eco-fiction authors will, will sort of stick together and promote each other because we're all kind of doing it not necessarily for ourselves, but to try and engage people in, in more sustainable practices. Okay, what are some of the common pitfalls or challenges that writers face when tackling um, eco-fiction and how can they overcome them? Um, Again, I think if you're writing, if your characters are just a vehicle for the ideas rather than being fully fledged, they're just going to be really shallow. And if the plot is just, um, you know, as a obviously a mechanism to to share climate solutions it's going to be it's not going to be that interesting so i think you you have to focus on the story first and foremost and be prepared to sacrifice a lot of stuff um but i mean it can be be really good fun doing that so um i guess i i like to do as much research on my characters as i do on the the topics 
So when I was creating the character, the Wizard of Wollstone, I went to our local pagan society <laughs> meeting. Um, I didn't even know we had a local pagan society. And uh, I met this chap there who was a wizard. So I was like, oh, so, you know, you're a wizard. What's that like? And he's like, I identify as a witch. <laughs> and it's like, well, that line's going in. <laughs> no, it, it was, um, so I think really sort of engaging with your characters, really getting to know them. So they're, what they do arises out of who they are. And what they do leads to plot points that naturally show the issues you're trying to talk about rather than tell the issues you're trying to talk about. So I wanted to give my readers of Habitat Man a kind of a nature-focused view of the world. So I had, you know, a character um, who, you know, a teenage boy who shot down a magpie. And then the rest of the magpies, you know, with his air rifle, and the rest of the magpies hated him. And they literally would dive bomb him with shit. <laughs> When they saw him, and there, <laughs> rebellious you know, magpies. This does happen. Yeah, this actually does happen. And the other, you know, magpies. You know, when a chick fell out of its nest, they would protect it. So he got to see the world through the eyes of a, a protective magpie parent, and then he realised, you know, a little bit about his own parent. You know who he'd been rebelling against, and um, so if you just, you know, animals were a lovely way in, just showing it through their their viewpoint, sort of making them little characters as well. Yeah, I, I love it when I read going. fiction and there's like a cat in there and it has a super like, quite, like I always remember reading Sabriel and there was a cat in there and I was just like, oh my God, I need to write a cat one day. <laughs> um, I, I love it. Um, okay, so before I ask you the ultimate podcast question, you've mentioned quite a few different um, mm -hmm. sort of authors and stories and things. I wondered if you could just summarise and give sort of a quick list of like recommendations for where people or, or the book titles or authors that people should look out for if they're interested in learning more about ecofiction. So a lot of depends on your tastes. So I know a lot of people like to go dark. I don't. I like to go really light. So what I, you know, suggest will reflect the fact that I like a bit of escapism and I don't like to go dark. But one of the things I loved was a psalm for the wild built by Becky Chambers. And I guess that's kind of solar punk, eco-fiction kind of crossover. Um, that, is that the same Becky Chambers who wrote um, the universe, the, the uh, what was it called? The, the one that's very popular. Um, she she does sci-fi. Is that the same? Becky yeah, Chambers? yes, I think it yeah. is. Yeah. 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 So that's that's really lovely. Um, what on Earth was the one where some of my ideas made in there by Susan Cope. Uh, that's young adult. Um, Overlord by Richard Powers is really well known based on trees. I think that won a Pulitzer Prize was a, a, a runner up. So um, people always cite uh, Barbara Kingsolver, Flight Behaviour. I didn't. I didn't finish it, but I think it's because it was based in America um, with characters I couldn't quite identify with. So um, it wasn't my cup of tea, but I think it is. A lot of people really liked it. Um, and of course, Habitat Man, which which, which I wrote, is very nature themed. Um, so those are some of the ones that I've mentioned there. Perfect. Thank you. I always think it's helpful, like when when it is something that's a completely new topic, just to have like yeah. that little go to list as well. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay, well, this is the Rebel Author Podcast. So <laughs> tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Okay, well, I hope this counts. I thought I'd choose a writing one. Okay, so um, the character in my book who shot a magpie as a teenage boy is loosely based, I hate to say, on my, my oldest son. He's never shot a magpie. But um, I entered the dating world roughly about the time he became a teenager, and that was not a good combo. So he was fiercely protective of me. If, if I went out in high heel boots, he'd call them my whore boots. <laughs> he was like a fucking Taliban. <laughs> Honestly, and he was so self-righteous about it. And, you know, so the... In, in Habitat Man, the main character falls in love with a woman who's got a son just like that, who's been given an air rifle by his dad to ward off potential suitors because it's bad for his mental health. <laughs> I love it. Anyway, my son's left home now and you'd think he would be over it, but no. <laughs> 
you know, any time there's any hint that his, his mother has any kind of sex life, he goes really weird. <laughs> so I was so constrained writing this book because I wanted a sex scene. Yeah. And um, and I'd written some, but then I kept thinking, oh, what if he reads this? Oh, it'll, like, you know, ruin him for life. So um, I kind of find myself really constrained by that. So that's not very rebellious, Sasha, but I did a teaser. I did a follow-up um, one. If you've read the end, if you want to know what happens next, in other words you know, a little bit old, rumpy, pumpy, get this free one. And then I wrote a nice steamy sex scene. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I call them smutterlogs. Like that's yeah, right. That's I, like, I didn't know yeah. it was a term. Well, I don't know who it is, but that's what I'm calling them because I do them too. <laughs> oh, well, uh, it's a term now. I'm going to, it's added to my website, courtesy yes. of Sasha Black. <laughs> if you want the smutterlog. <laughs> I'll it. see if there's any more downloads now. Yeah. I've, I've called it that. I bet there will be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell everyone where they can find out more about you, your books, your services, anything else that you'd like to add. Okay, so um, what I do is on dabaden.com. That's B A D E N. And that's um, got my publications and my speaking events and um, research and so on. And um, if you want to know about the Green Stories competition, that's um, greenstories.org.uk. And um, that's got all the upcoming writing competitions. And um, oh, it's got another project on. Do I have time to mention another project that we're doing right now? Um, it's really fun. <laughs> so um, we're doing a project with BAFTA and uh, Rubber Republic and ALBA, which is the sustainable. BAFTA, BAFTA is in BAFTA, BAFTA, the movie BAFTA. Yeah, BAFTA's. Uh, Awards. British Academy Film, Film and Television yeah. Awards. Oh, wow. And, oh, um, That's amazing. I know. Isn't it fun? And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we wanted to raise the issue of characters on television. Like, is it still okay that we have high-consuming characters as aspirations? So, for example, if you watch Sex and the City or Emily in Paris, you know, with their walk-in wardrobes, <laughs> I mean, you need a Paris agreement just, just, just for Emily, really. You know, is it still okay to be showing that as aspirational? So we're doing a project, and if you check it out on social media, it's hashtag climate characters or hashtag hot or not. And we've got some really fun little comparisons. So, like, for example, we've got a fun one, Bond versus Reacher. So you've got James Bond with his single-use Aston Martins, you know, <laughs> his huge wardrobe of tailored luxury suits. And you've got Jack Reacher, who only travels by bus, who uh, slays in second-hand clothing. <laughs> so, you know, Reacher just takes uh, one planet to kill all the bad guys, whereas James Bond takes 20 planets worth of resources <laughs> to kill off the bad guys. And we've, we've got them for all kinds of different characters. Oh, and it's just awesome. a really fun way to just start that conversation. You know, is it still okay to be showing really high consumption lifestyles as, as aspirational, but in a fun way? Amazing. Can you? I don't think I've got the link for that. Would you? Right. Would you send so me it the was. Link, um, so. I'll send you the link, and it's um, hashtag hashtag climate characters um, and hashtag hot or not. Brilliant. I, I, I'd just like to make sure those go in the show notes. Well, yeah. thank you so much for your time today. And of course, a gigantic thank you to all of the show's listeners and all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I am Sasha Black. You are listening to Denise Baden. And this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I'm talking to Pepper Ann, and we are talking all about the dangers of writing true crime uh, and what happens when real threats are made. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review. Mm-hmm.